In 922, an envoy from the Caliph in Baghdad named Ahmad ibn Fadlan reached the area around modern-day Kazan in Russia after experiencing the coldest winter he had ever known. In this region around the Volga River, he encountered some men from the Rus. Now, the Rus were Swedish Vikings who raided in Eastern Europe and traded with the Byzantine and Islamic empires in the, uh, principally in the 10th century AD. And although Norse in origin, they eventually converted to Eastern Orthodox Christianity and after founding many cities in modern day Russia and Ukraine, such as Kiev and Novgorod, uh, assimilated to Slavic language and customs. Now the Rus men encountered by Ibn Fadlan uh, and written about by him in his Risala, or his account of his journey, which has been translated recently in a book by Paul Lundy and Carolyn Stone called Ibn Fadlan and the Land of Darkness, uh, which also includes many other very interesting uh, Arabic traveler accounts of the uh, world to their north. Uh, his account details many things about these ruse. For instance, he was impressed by how handsome he thought they were. Uh, he calls them ruddy in complexion and some of the best physical specimens he saw along his trip. He often complains about how uh, unfit various peoples he encounters are. Uh, he was uh, disgusted by some things, such as their practice of washing from a communal basin. Uh, but he was also pretty objective in his tone, and he described some interesting facts, like the uh, he says that the Rus were covered from their necks to the tips of their toes in dark green tattoos. If this is uh, so, this is the only real direct evidence we have of Norse tattooing, although, of course, with the Rus, the potential of mixing with Slavic customs is always present. Most famously, Ibn Fadlan witnessed the funeral of a Rus chieftain, which he describes in great detail as it was a strange and compelling thing to witness. According to him, after this man had died, he was placed in uh, fine clothing for a few days while the funeral was prepared, and his slaves were asked which one would go with him. One had to volunteer. Eventually, a woman slave volunteered and she was treated very well for a while, fed and tended to. Meanwhile, the man's ship was drawn ashore and propped up on wooden supports. The man was then placed on top of a bed with food around him in the, in the ship, and a dog, two horses, two cows, and a rooster were then sacrificed and put into the boat with him. The female slave who had volunteered to die with him now went around and had ritual sex with the man's followers. Before, near the ship, a wooden door frame uh, was constructed without a door and uh, she was lifted over this wooden door frame. She chanted something there which Ibn Fadlan provides in a uh, translation in Arabic. Of course, we don't know which exact language she was speaking in. Was this Old Norse? Was this something more akin to Old Russian? It's hard to say. But according to Ibn Fadlan, what she said, and then translated by Paul Lundy and Carolyn Stone into English, was, There I see my father and my mother. There I see all my dead relatives sitting. There I see my master sitting in paradise, and paradise is green and beautiful. There are men with him and young people, and he is calling me. Take me to him. Now, in the movie The 13th Warrior, which begins with Antonio Banderas as Ibn Fadlan witnessing this funeral, uh, this is rendered in a somewhat different way, which has become very famous on the internet uh, among Norse enthusiasts and interested people, uh, not all of whom are aware that the movie is the source of this variant. Lo, there do I see my father. Lo, there do I see my mother and my sisters and my brothers. Lo, there do I see the line of my people back to the beginning. Lo, they do call to me, they bid me take my place among them in the halls of Valhalla, where the brave may live forever. I put halls of Valhalla in quotes because the word hall is already in Valhalla. Uh, people very often ask me to translate that into Old Norse. I think the closest I could get, because often uh, what we want to say is not easy to say in uh, a medieval or ancient language. Thar sek fodermin, 
Þar sek móður mína og systur mínar og bröður mína. Þar sek forfeður mína allt til upphafs. Þá kalla mig, þá bjóða mig velkomna til sín. Í valhól þar sfröknir menn lifa eh. But of course that's just an imaginary reconstruction of how to say in Old Norse something that is written for a movie or earlier Michael Crichton book uh, based on something Ibn Fadlan says he heard in a language that he doesn't identify. Anyway, after saying this chant that bring the woman a chicken, she rips off its head and throws it away, then she throws its body into the ship. Then she takes off two bracelets and give them, gives them to an old ugly woman that Ibn Fadlan says is presiding over this called the Angel of Death. Now the girl is brought to the ship and she's given a strong drink. She sings a song over it, which Ibn Fadlan says is to say goodbye to all of her female companions. But she lingers too long and the angel of death starts rushing her. The girl gets confused, maybe because she's drunk or drugged, and starts shouting, but the angel of death drags her into the boat and the men around the ship start making a commotion with their weapons to drown out the girl's screaming. Then six men have ritual sex with her inside the ship once again. Uh, then these four men, uh, one each grabs one of her arms, one of her legs, and then two men uh, garret her with a rope while the angel of death stabs her in the ribs with a knife. The closest male relative of the man who is being buried or, or cremated here uh, then walks backwards naked towards the ship with a torch in one hand that he lights it with. Uh, Ibn Fadlan says that while he was witnessing the ship burn up, uh, one of the Rus said to him through an interpreter, you Arabs are fools because you put the men you love most and the most noble among you into the earth, and the earth and the worms and the insects eat them. But we burn them in the fire in an instant, so that at once and without delay they enter paradise. And then afterwards he adds, his Lord for love of him has sent a wind that will bear him hence within the hour. Again, these translations are by Paul Lundy and Carolyn Stone from their book. I don't speak Arabic, so I can't comment on the translation, but it is uh, to be praised for its clarity. Uh, then when the ship had been burned, they uh, raised a mound uh, at the spot, and in the middle they set up a wooden post that Ibn Fadlan had said had the name of the man uh, cremated there and the name of his king, and then they left on their way. Now this funeral is not very similar to the funerals that we read about in the sagas, although we do know that cremation was practiced in some Norse areas before the coming of Christianity. S some Norse sources do mention something kind of similar though, for instance the way that Snorri describes the funeral of Balder after his death, which I've talked about in detail in my video about the death of Balder that I'll link in a card in the top right, uh, does have many similarities to this, including the burning of the dead man in a ship. And often burial mounds were designed in the shape of a ship, or in fact the dead person was even buried in a ship in the mound, such as the uh, burial mound at Usaberg in Norway, uh, the, the famous ship from which is on display at the Viking Ship Museum in Oslo. There are also interesting little details uh, that are similar to details mentioned in some of our sources for Norse myth. For instance, in Saxo's Gesta Danorum, a woman who is visiting hell rips the head off of a rooster and then throws it over the gate of hell. She immediately then hears it singing on the other side. So perhaps there's something symbolic in the way that the girl who rips the head off of a rooster throws part of it into the ship, expecting that it will then sing on the other side in the afterlife. Also, the way that the man walks backward naked toward the ship with his torch might remind us of the way that the vulva or witch or Sirius often behaves in the sagas. For instance, in Vatnstilla saga, the saga of the people of Vatnstall, a witch who's trying to put a spell on her enemies walks backwards around her house naked with her dress hanging over her head, staring out from between her knees. So perhaps this is done as a way to approach the afterworld or some other world that one is trying to conjure with magic without facing it or facing it in a conventional way. Well, I hope this video has been somewhat interesting for you, and uh, I hope that if you enjoy these videos, which are made free because I don't believe that information is uh, something that should be locked in an ivory tower or behind archaic language, you'll consider taking a look at my Patreon, where I have uh, some rewards for supporters who pledge uh, to help me make these videos with as little as a dollar a month. I hope you'll also consider checking out uh, my own translations, which are made fr directly from the Old Norse language, such as my translation of the Poetic Edda, the main source of the myths of the Norse gods and heroes, 
or my translation of the Saga of the Volsungs and the Saga of Ragnar Lothbrok, two of the greatest sagas of Viking heroes. For now, from beautiful Colorado, I'm wishing you all the best.